Hi, everyone. This is going to be a continuation of our episode series on the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, but it's a subpart of episode three. We were looking at the finding of the Ebionites that was recorded by Epiphanius that Paul had actually been a Gentile and how that investigation had come about. And here today, I'm going to build on that a little bit more. And uh, I think uh, I, I in all the years that I've examined Paul, I've never really take, taken the time to take a look at this issue carefully that uh, Eisenman had been defending, that Herod, uh, Herod's family was what Paul belonged to and that that had any significance. And now I'm seeing the significance. So the first significance is it backs up the finding of the Ebionites recorded by Epiphanius, and he's being critical of them. Uh, of, uh, Epiphanius is being critical in the late 300s against the Ebionites, so let's let's listen to the heading here, and I'll read that uh, quote, the finding again at the Ebionites from Epiphanius in a second. How's Paul? How Paul's true vacation as a theater set decorator? So you're all told told he's a tent maker. That's false, and it's an absolute provable fact that even the best lexi, one of the best le lexicons, says so. And uh, published in 1957, every uh, uh, almost every school, every religious Christian Protestant school in America has to use this dictionary or primarily does. And yet this is that this is their correction that this is not a, a tent tent maker. He is a set decor. He's a set stagehand or set decorator. And I'm going to show you uh, how the scholars build that build that out. So how is Paul's true vacation as a theater set decorator best explain, explained by Paul's Herod family connection to Herod's theater theater? The Herod family had built an amazing theater in Jerusalem, which then confirms the evidence finding of Paul as a Gentile. So if we can, can we can solidify this connection between Paul and the Herodian family, then then we can prove and back up the Ebionites. And also it raises interesting questions of what's Paul's true motivation. And uh, so is the reason in Romans 13, he says we're supposed to obey the ruling authorities, governing authorities. Uh, because what when they tell us to do something, that their words are ordained by God, and if you violate that uh, command, their commands, you're violating God's commands. I mean, literally, he puts that higher than he does the Torah, which in in uh, Galatians three nineteen he says uh, it's just a it's uh, given by angels through a mediator, and then he denigrates it and he calls them weak and beggarly celestial beings later in uh, Galatians four nine as Vincent explained. Anyway, so let's take a look. I think you'll find this very uh, uh, cha life-changing. Okay, so uh, Epiphanius, uh, who was speaking on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church era, that's when uh, they had a crime, actually a crime called Judaizing. So if you try to get people to rest on Shabbat, you're a Judaizer, you're a criminal, and you're punished uh, by the government. So this is where there's no freedom of religion anymore. You have to believe in everything that you don't believe in. So in, he's attacking the Ebionites in a, a commentary he's making in the three, three, 50, 50s, three 80s for their belief in one God, not three gods. And, and he mentions the findings just to show how uh, antagonistic they were to Paul. He tells us the findings they had made about Paul. And so here's what he wrote uh, in the Panarian 30.16. 6-9. They declare that he, Paul, was a Greek. He went up Jerusalem, they say, and when he had spent some time there, he was seized with a passion to marry the daughter of the priest. For this reason, he became a proselyte and was circumcised. Then, when he failed to get the girl, he flew into rage and wrote against circumcision and against the Sabbath and the law. Okay, so that sounds very judicial in scope. It's like they're literally investigating his background, who, who he really was, and it wasn't anything as he was representing in his words. Because what do we have? He says, I was circumcised. I was born a Jew and circumcised on the eighth day, Philippians 3, verse 5. So they're finding out he's being untruthful to them. And so let's keep going and see what's, what's going on. Well, we know for a fact that Paul was of the family of Herod because he actually says so in the book of Romans, the Roman road to whatever you think it is. I think it's not where other people think it's heading you for. He greets Herodian, my kinsman, my relative. And uh, as Eisenman, who's able to recognize these things, he's a scholar in Middle Eastern customs and everything. So the Herodian family would name themselves with that appellation, Herod, and then some other reference that would make sure people could all know who they belong to because status was that name. And so if you were a relative, you'd use that name in your name and then, or your children's name, and you, you would then 
uh, be uh, exuding this power. And again, what was King Herod? King Herod the Great with the time of Jesus at the killing of the children of the Bethlehem. That's called Herod the Great. His son, Herod Antipas, whose relative was also at the Church of Antioch, Manaean. We'll get to that in a second. And, uh, and that was his childhood friend. But he also was a child friend. Uh, Herod Antipas also was a childhood friend of somebody else. So we'll, that was Paul, as we showed you in Acts 13.1. We're going to read that again today. So just to refresh our memories here. So uh, the the uh, that so that was why Eisenman said he knew that he was relative of Herod because of this reference. And then he talked about the Josephus reference of Solus, who uh, Josephus specifically says Solus, which is a person who fits Paul in every characteristic, is in the time of uh, the Christian movement, and Paul had not yet been been part of it. He was Solus, and he was uh, working with the high priest to to refute and defeat the lower order priest asking for pay, extra pay. So that uh, Josephus said that was a, a relative of Herod himself. So that was another proof. So he actually had those two proofs. But let's continue. And then here's the whole things. Uh, now the Herod family tried to tell Jews that they were Jews. Why? Because Rome appointed Herod to be the king of the Jews. They wanted to use a name that the Jewish people would recognize as an authority. And so king is just as good as a Roman uh, consul or Roman uh, administrator name. Let's give them the name they're used to. And it's called king. And But Herod took it seriously. I'm the king of the Jews. And so uh, that was his king, Herod the Great. But all the children, they split up the uh, monarchy on the death of the father into four parts, and they each were kings of their little areas. And Herod to Herod fell to Dr Herod the Tetrarch, known as Herod Antipas. That's his actual personal name, Herod Antipas. He is the one who uh, does a couple of things. He kills John the Baptist, and he also is the one who hears the case about Jesus and refers him to trial and execution to to uh, to Pilate. So he was intending Jesus would be executed by doing that. He doesn't do it. It goes back over to the administrator who's who has that final, uh, you know, unpleasant task. I'm sure to kill people all day long can't be that exciting a job to have. And uh, OK, so uh, and then he was a Roman collaborator. And again, uh, King Herod the Great. And one of his sons was Herod Antipas, who succeeds him in the time of Christ. OK, so we got all that there. Now, here's the uh, the passage we're going to look at today in, in depth is. Is, so we ask a question, is Paul a set decorator of the core at theaters, a type of stagehand in Acts 18.3? Okay, now you're going to say, Doug, that sounds preposterous. We never heard that. That's exactly right. It's suppressed, so you don't hear it. But the best lexicon in, well, one of the best lexicons in Greek explains this in detail, and it's beyond doubt. I mean, it's not even a question mark, and yet none of the Bibles, I'm going to show you, every single Bible suppresses this fact. Even, if, even though it's after this dictionary became well-known and is used in seminaries throughout the country. Anyway, the, name, the word is skenopios. So here we read this, 18.3. Because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were skenopios by trade. So Paul had a trade. And you might say, well, you know, stagehand, set decorator, that doesn't sound like somebody like Paul. Well, you're you're underestimating things, ladies and gentlemen. People didn't have TV in those days. So what did they have? They had theater. Theater was a very integral part of Roman and uh, Greek life, just like it is for you. You spend six, six hours a day at the TV. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to try to go to the theater, and they're going to hear the plays of Sophocles, such as Dionysius, the dying god, that Jesus' words on the road to Damascus somehow wants to quote from that play. So, so the people reading what Paul put there and recorded what Jesus, his Jesus said to him was quoting a play from Sophocles so that, see, you don't see it, but the play, people who are speak Greek can see these things. Theater was a big deal. And that's why uh, this is not an irrelevant factor. This is actually explains a lot. This tells you who Paul really was. And is there any debate? That's what it means here. And that's the real question. We'll continue. Now, I just want to show you Here's scholars writing on what is the theater. They have nothing to do with Christianity. No debates of ours, okay? And uh, let me see if I can see their name. Christian. I can't read their name here. I'll, I'll blow it up later. But anyway, it's called What is the Theater? And this is what they explain is the meaning of Scanopios. 
but you have to start up here. The art of scenography, scenography, making, making scenery in a play, was thus set in place when Greek theater became established as an essential social practice, essential social practice. So if this is Paul's career, he is involved in essential social practice. That's number one, meaning people would look up to him quickly becoming a trade tantamount to that of a painter. So it wasn't a disrespectful thing to, to design sets. It was very artistic, in, in fact. The Scenopios is one who designs the decor, while the Poetes is the person who crafts the story and the verse. So he's not the writer, but he sees how it's written. He learns how plays are written. He learns how to use words to be very phonetic and very, uh, you know, memorable. Okay. And therefore, the one who produces stage effects that were in no way rudimentary. Uh, yeah. The creation of the spectacle, decorations, that would be Paul's job, and machines, probably also Paul's job, thus resulted in considerable expenditures. So the people who are paid to do this aren't making little bucks. They're making big bucks. And who was the biggest <laughs> payer of all for this type of work? Well, you're going to, uh, did I cover this already? Uh, let me go back and just show you. Maybe I didn't cover it. Uh, let's see where I'm going to go to. Here it is. This is Herod the Great's theater. His relative. I'm going to say it right out. If Herodian is his relative, and if Saulus is what Josephus uh, is, ta is talking about is Paul, and he says he's Herod's relative, Herod Antipas' relative, actually, is what Josephus says, then this is not a, this is not a far stretch because now let's see what, Herod the Great did Herod's theater, Bible, history, maps, and images, and so on. Herod the Great built a marvelous theater in Jerusalem, upper city. Herod the Great dies by 1 BC. Don't ask, but the calendar's off by a few years. Uh, but that's uh, his date of death. The f it was a large auditorium with no roof and had semicircular rows of seats ascending from the center stage. So let's imagine you are the son of Herod the Great, who created this, and your father was the one who uh, asked the wise men for where was Jesus involving his birth, where is that taking place, and he didn't ask that on an honest way. He wanted to kill all the, uh, kill the Messiah in his crib, but when he couldn't get the truth from the uh, Magi, he just killed all the children in Bethlehem in a certain, uh, from one age, I think it was age two down to zero, you know, newborns. So that's that's the family we're dealing with. And then Herod Antipas is the one who kills John the Baptist. And so Herod Antipas is going to be mentioned in the next verse. So just keep that in mind. The one who kills, the one who killed John the Baptist and who basically if you're, if you're not paying attention, Herod is the king of Jerusalem, king of uh, Judea area, and he sends Jesus back to Pilate for the trial and execution. That meant he was sending Jesus to his death. Pilate knew he was just supposed to do whatever he was being told implicitly is get rid of this guy. I don't like any rebellion in my empire. And that's why he was so adamant in killing uh, the, the babies and why uh, his, his father was adamant in killing the babies. And he himself was willing to kill John the Baptist. We'll show you that later. Okay, Josephus writes on the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod the Tetrarch Antipas, Herod Antipas. So let me read this to you. This is, we, this is something we found, uh, we knew about it, but we didn't pay much attention to this until recently. And it's Acts 13, verse 1. And now I think it's very important. Listen to this. And I also want to show you, I've, I went and researched a little bit more, and there's something that was uh, left out or not made clear. So I'm going to put it in here. And that's this word, childhood friend. You see where I have, who had been a childhood friend of? So this is Bible Hub telling you what the words mean there. And it was translated, you know, who grew up with, <laughs> you know. No, no, no. They were childhood companions. Basically, they're play, playmates together when they were children. So let's listen to this. And then you're going to see somebody else is included, Manaean. Herod Antipas and someone else are the childhood companions of Manan. Okay, let's read it. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, it's probably Luke, by the way, and Manan, who had been childhood friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now you say, wait a minute, there's a comma there. That means it wasn't Saul, somebody else. He's an afterthought. No, no. There is no comma in Greek. And I just want to repeat this to those who didn't see this in the last episode. 
In Greek, the ancient texts we're looking at are all written in what's called scriptio continua. Do you see that? It means there's no spaces, punctuation, or different letters, cases, distinguished words, phrases, or sentences. So how are we supposed to know? You just read it out loud. The only way to decipher these texts was to read them out loud, even to oneself, to hear their syntactic structure. So I'll read it out loud again. Don't look at the comma they threw in there to throw you off. And there they were in the church that was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Tyrene and Menaean, who had been a childhood friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Period. That tells you Paul Saul was a childhood friend of Herod, the person who sent Jesus to his death. Now do you understand where Paul stands in this bigger picture? But why did he lie about being a gent, uh, not being that he had been circumcised on the eighth day when the, the Evian find out that's false. That means he was a Herodian and he was covering it up. And he was, you know, they, they, they didn't have to circumcise their kids because they're not really, they're not really, really Jewish. Their ancestors were, but they aren't uh, in that sense. So uh, this is, this is why there is a good question. Now, what's the motivation of Paul given this cover up and these lies and there, you know, as a Christian, you can't lie, you know, but he thinks you can apparently. Now, who is Herod Antipas? I just want to show you again. He is one of the sons of Herod who succeeds to the kingdom of Herod the Great. And they, the four sons, uh, well, the sons split it up in different divisions. And he's one division, and that's Judea. So here's what it says the uh, in the Antiquities of the Jews, book 18. And Josephus confirmed that Herod Antipas slew John the Baptist after imprisoning him at Mechares because he feared John's influence might enable him to start a rebellion. Now, of course, the Bible gives us a different perspective of what that is. I, I would just say this. He has he can have multiple motives. He could have made a promise to his uh, niece when she's dancing or whatever, and he does something uh, that he doesn't want to do, or at least that's the way he gave cover to it. So another thing is you got to understand it, Josephus may know something behind the scenes. And so this whole thing with the daughter dancing and in promising, I'll give you half my kingdom, all that could have been all put on to in order him to execute somebody who had been otherwise very popular. But it, but Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, had no choice. He had to do this. So do you see, my friends, it makes absolute sense that Paul, at least you know initially in his mission to attack Christianity, is definitely serving them. But I, I definitely am beginning to have doubts about him while he's allegedly a Christian because, number one, why is there Romans 13 where you have to obey the governing authorities because they they are actually agents of God who are ordained and the laws they give you are, you know, are just and good? When he denigrates the law of giving Moses as given by angels through through a mediator, and why do you gent Gentiles about he's talking about Sabbath? Why do you want to be subject to the weak and beggarly? Angel, uh, celestial beings and be in bondage. So he makes law compliance for the Sabbath is a bondage when Jesus says law, breaking the law is, I mean, excuse me, sinning under the law is bondage, but being obeying the law is how you get freedom. So Paul has this absolute inversion of what Jesus teaches, what the Bible always taught. Governing authorities are not from God. They're in, under the authority of Satan. But Paul has a completely opposite con viewpoint. Anyway, so now I want to show you, is this a legitimate point I'm making about the name? Here it is. I want to go back. Scon it's a hard name. Scanopios in Acts. So let's take a look. So here it is. What is the BDAG dictionary? So we have to take a look at this. This is, uh, it'll cost you $130, $60 to buy this online if you want to have it. So I have to kind of recreate this because I don't like spending money like that on just finding one thing. But I'll, I'll use books.google.com to look it up. And I, I was able to confirm it's in the 19th. The translation of the word there, Skinopoios, is definitely in there in the 1957 edition online at books.google.com. I'm going to show you that. So here, here's here, I'm, now I made a quote of it so I can so we can all read it. It's much more easy to read, and also uh, it's just simpler to present this way first. And then I'm going to show you the books.google.com version. BDAG Greek lexicon points to the better attested use of the word is from the context of old comedy in which it denotes a, quote, stagehand or manufacturer stage properties. And I showed you the more the scholarly scholars who get deep dive into uh, theater say it's a person who designs the decor for the play and that's a very expensive thing they're doing. And it's like painting. It's the art form. 
So it's not an ignoble profession. It wasn't meant to uh, at all arouse hatred of Paul. No, Luke is trying to win an appeal to the Romans, to, to Nero. And that's why he's using, he's pulling out every stop. The connection to Hero is positive. That's why he's bringing it out. Not Would we think it's positive? No, it's not for us. The book of Acts is not for Christians. It's for the pagans who would be impressed by Paul's connection, boyhood friendship with Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, okay, let's read. The problem of the familiar tent maker rendering is that outside the New Testament, Scanopios is used only in the theatrical sense. So in other words, only in our Greek New Testament has it ever been translated as a tent maker. Only. Everywhere else in ancient history. It's always what we're talking about. Stagehands who do set decorations. Uh, all right. Uh, that could refer to a tent, but <clears throat> okay. So technically the words there could refer to a tent, but we don't have any example where that's actually what it meant. Okay. That's, that's the point, but there's nothing in the context of 18.3 to resolve the sense in favor of tent maker. So if it meant a tent, you would have to be, you know, we went camping and we were using the tent made by Paul, <laughs> you the tent maker. Then you could say it. But if it doesn't say that, it doesn't imply that because we don't have any we don't have any record of it ever being used in that way. Although theoretically, it's an, a movable equipment, so maybe it could. But it, moving equip movable equipment is what a stagehand who's doing set decorations does, right? Here's what BDAG concludes, and this is why I say this this should have ended the issue. In the absence of any use of Scanopius beyond the passive in Pollux and Hermes. Uh, and the lack of specific qualifiers in the tax of, 18, of Acts 18.3. So there's no qualifier saying the word tent or something like that. One is left with a strong probability that Luke's public in urban areas where theatrical productions were in abundance would think of Scanopios in reference to matters theatrical. Now I'm going to prove to you this is actually what it says, so I had to verify that. Okay, first, this is the, the way this text appears today in its third edition. But it was originally issued in 1957, and that's mentioned here in the Wikipedia on um, Bowers Lexicon, as it used to be known. And uh, now it's in its third edition in 2001, but it was released in 1957. We'll show you that. And anyway, he, this is Mr. Bauer. He was born in 1877 in Königsberg, Germany, and he died in 1960. So when we go here and we research at books.google.com, this is how you can do good research. And it basically excludes all websites. It just goes to books. And so it narrows down what you're focusing on right, right off the bat. And they did a huge project to scan all the books of the world. The, all the five major libraries scanned every single book. They didn't care what it was. It could have been about how to make matches. <laughs> they, they scanned everything. And that's why we have such a treasure just from those top five. And now they keep, they're keep they doing the project. Books.google.com. So we type in Bowers Lexicon 1957. We look it up. This is it. 1957. And we can see that the part of the quote that we really care about is here. The lack of specific qualifiers in the text, and it doesn't always give you full quote. That's the problem. And the lack of specific qualifiers in the text of Acts 18.3, one is left with the strong probability that Luke's publics in an urban area where theatrical productions were in abundance would think of Scolopios in reference to matters theatrical. So we can tell it was there. I'm not going to pay $164 to prove to you if you don't agree with, if you wonder you can go buy it and tell us if I'm wrong, but there's, I'm, we're only missing one word really to know the truth. Okay. Anyway. So, uh, but you can see here, this is where we got it from. And again, you have the scholars who are neutral that don't care about Christianity at all are telling you that's what it means. They're the Scanopios is one who designs the decor. And I've, I've read this to you already. And I just want to show you. So since 1957, this top scholar lexicon used in many, or if not most, theological seminaries to this day to teach Greek, the meanings of the words in Greek. This book has always said what I told you, has a strong probability, which means not just probable, strong probability that it meant the, th the theater, a person who works in the theater. So look at this. Take a look at the Christian's Deal. Are these people doing translations that are because they believe that because the Greek mandates you use the word tent maker, or is it is it in defiance of the fact that we knew from 1957 onward that it didn't mean that, and the strong probability is it meant he was a set decorator, which is nothing to be ashamed about. But I'm sure they feel it's a shameful profession. I'm sure they feel it's like below him, it's beneath him. 
But actually, it tells knowing everything we can about Paul is crucial because then you can see, well, well how could he have been a set decorator in Jerusalem? Where, where, where would he have worked? He would have worked at Herod's Theater. That's the only one there. And, it, and it's his relatives. Now, look here. I Zero of 14 on the first page. There's one, two, one more panel to go. Zero of these 14, all of these are post-1957, sometimes years later, some are from 2016, and none of them on this set have changed it from tent maker to what we now knew since 1957 is the strong probability that it had to be something theatrical. Let's look at the next, the remaining. And these, again, all of these are the 1957 works. I excluded anything prior to 1957. And there was zero of, of 10 on this page. So now you have zero of 24 of, of Bibles written after 1957 when this fact should have been well known and accepted and cracked through somewhere, but nobody lets it through. Come on. These are this is what I this is proof again. We have theological translators. We do not have translators Greek. We have people who are willing to skew the word from an improbable to an improbability because they don't want to accept the truth of what it really says. And accepting truth is very important. You have to accept strong probabilities because if you don't, you're believing in a lie, a delusion. And then you don't really understand who Paul really is, and you won't even realize it is important that he connects. He's where is he working? <laughs> He'd been in Jerusalem for quite a long time. He said he's, you know, he's working for the high priest. Well, what are you doing to make a living? You're killing people in the day. Are you being paid by the high priest to kill people? I don't think so. So, what are you doing? I was a Scanopios. So let's look that up. Oh, your your relative, King Herod, made the theater in the town. It's huge. Theaters go on all the time, and you're getting paid a lot of money for that. That's great, Paul Saul. But our our theological translators won't tell you that. I just want to show you that Christian scholars have been trying to push back and advocating that the Bibles be changed. It's not, I'm not the only one who's saying something. Uh, here in the book, The Hermeneutics of Doctrine, as part of a discussion of Christian doctrine as dramatic narrative, Thistleton notes the argument of L.L. L. Wellborn that the tent maker is an unlikely translation of Stuck. Scanapios in Acts 18.3, and then it goes on to this. This is how I found the, uh, the whole point. Uh, the BDAG, and I just want to read you something else here. Uh, Wellborn thinks that in speaking of Christians as fools or clowns for the sake of Christ, that's what Paul says, ah, we're fools and we're being clowns. This was a character in, in theater. So he says, uh, this is where you'll find it, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, 1 Corinthians f f chapter 4, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 16 to 17. So that's a theoretical term, not a... A uh, rhetorical term. I'm a fool. I'm a clown. That's exactly a character played in many Greek plays. So you have the fool character and the clown, and then you have the serious part of the play. So there's humor in the middle of play. Very clever. The Greeks came up with all these ideas. So all of the evidence we saw here today reconfirms that the Ebonites did put Paul on trial, did an investigation, proved that he wasn't even a Jew. He was Greek and tells this account that he actually had a history of coming to Jerusalem, uh, living there for some time, and then he falls in love with the daughter of the priest, and then because he, he gets proselytized, he, becomes, he, he wants to become a Jew, so he, he signs up. He's circumcised at that point in time. Then he failed to get the girl and goes into anger and retaliates against Judaism is what they're saying. And that, that could very well explain everything from a Herodian point of view. And uh, what the church had to know, if they'd heard of Philippians and gotten a copy of that by this time, they would know that he had lied to them and said he was a Jew and circumcised on the eighth day, Philippians 3, chapter 5. That would be a definite no-no. And they, this may explain why Jesus says in the book of Revelation, written in 65, 67, approximately a couple of years after Paul's death, that there were those who say they are Jews but are not. Wow, Revelation 3.19, do people, 3.9, do people do that? Apparently. And they probably would have finally gotten the book Epistle of Romans. Remember, Luke is going to travel all the way to Rome with Paul. Do you think he hasn't met the church there? And now the letter that was mailed to Rome, they're going to see it because Luke is on our side. He's, he's not on the uh, Paul side, he's contrary to what people believe. He's definitely trying to win an appeal for the whole church. And he's he's leaving Paul on a limb. Whatever Paul says, it's even if it's crazy, the, the God does not live in temple made of, made of human hands in Acts 17. Of course he lives at the temple made of human hands. But 
Luke puts it in there because that's exactly what Ro uh, Greek and Roman gods do not live in temples. They visit temples, but they never live there. They live on Mount Olympus, roaming naked on the mountaintops. So let's say they get uh, Luke gets a copy of the book Epistle to the Romans, but when he goes to Rome and he's visiting with Paul and he visits them and he finds out this, <laughs> Romans 16, 11, Paul says, greet Herodian, my kinsman, my relative. So the other thing is he would have read Romans 13. I want to read this, and this to me is conclusive, that there's no way Paul could have been a believer in God, Yahweh. No, because he's put, he's put governing authorities above them. He denigrates the law given Yahweh in Galatians chapter 3, verse uh 19, saying it was given by angels through to a mediator. Why do you want to, the, the Sabbath's keeping Galatians, he says, why do you want to be in bondage again to the celestial beings? That's in Galatians 4, 9. Listen to this and tell me if this isn't putting the law of man, of human beings, above the law of God. Romans 13, this is Mouncey's reverse. Every person must be subject to the governing authorities, the hyperechia exousia, because there is no authority, no exousia, except by God's appointment, theos, and, and those that presently exist have been instituted by God. So the governing authorities that presently exist, these evil people who've been killing babies and who've been killing Christians and, and sentenced Jesus to death, they're all instituted by God. So what, doesn't that mean Jesus was rightly executed? Does anybody not process this math here? <laughs> Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has decreed. So Jesus is righteously killed. Does he not know what he's saying? He doesn't process anything, ladies and gentlemen. But he's processing it in favor of his true ruler, not Christ. His true ruler is the Herodians, has decreed. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Damnation is actually the word. The Karima will be damned. So if you don't obey the Herodian rulers in your area, you're going to be damned. But he insulted Jesus as being executed correctly here. Now, just listen to the true apostles giving you the opposite message when rulers governing authorities which the sanhedrin of of uh, the romans allowed the sanhedrin to still operate as a judicial court they couldn't execute anyone they would have to hand that over to the roman authorities for execution but they had every other penalty they could uh, imp implement in within their religious law let's read this acts 5 26 29 then the captain went into the offices and brought them meaning the apostles but not with force they feared the people lest they be stoned Verse 27, and they brought them and had them stand before the council, the Synhedrion. The high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you a strict order to stop teaching in this name. And so if Paul's involved, wouldn't he say, you've got to obey the governing authorities because they're there ordained by God. Let's see if our apostles agree with Paul. <laughs> Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring on us the blood of this man. But in response, Peter and the other apostles, which included John, by the way, said it is necessary to be God rather than men. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a hundred percent contradiction. But what really explains it is Paul is an Herodian. He is not a Christian. He is a fraud. He's a liar. He lied about himself being circumcised on the eighth day. He lied. He was a Jew. And he it, he betrayed himself by saying things that gave it away i he re, he he uh saluted his kinsman his relative herodian that's a gi dead giveaway and luke even gave it away in the book of acts in 13 1 when he says he was a childhood friend menaeum was a childhood friend of herod antipas and uh, the, the tetrarch and uh is, is also known as antipas and paul saul so there you go it's it's uh, I think the evidence is now pretty much becoming overwhelming that Paul actually isn't even a Christian like I always assumed. I've always given him grace. Think of, oh, you know, he's deluded. Now I'm really wondering, although he does say things that why would anyone say this like he's under the force of a demon? Why would he say that in Second Corinthians 12? I'm I have to still process this. So it's not completely worked out in my head how he can both be a, a Herodian agent and, and how he can be under the influence of a demon, and he admits it to us in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, and his Jesus refuses him three times. I, I still have to believe he thinks he had an experience with someone called Jesus in his mind, in ecstasy, is, and that's what explains all of this. Okay, anyway, it's not we're not completely have a solution here of what both of these messages, but what we do know is that Ebion made the correct finding. Paul was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. All right, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.